right now. I need your help. I need your help to, to, to save me from these moments. That is, that takes consistency. That takes commitment. That takes faithfulness. And so we're going to stay in the book of Acts. And what I love is that the book of Acts chapter 1 spoke of a mother, of a good mother. Her name was Mary. And we talked about her from the book of Acts on Mother's Day. We're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 10 to read about a good father, a good dad, a good man. Not a perfect man, but we're going to see a great moment of transformation in his life. And so I'm going to ask if you would simply stand with me, stretch out for just a second. And this allows us to simply focus and, okay, we're going to his word. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, most of it is there in your bulletin, in your Bibles, on your phones, on the screens, in your hearts. It says in verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. Say that name, Cornelius. Who was he? He was a centurion, a, a, a soldier in what was known as the Italian regiments. He wasn't just a soldier. He was a captain, a leader. You'll, you'll know a little bit more about him right now. Well, this man, Cornelius, he and his family, a father, he and his family were devout and God-fearing, devoted, committed, consistent, faithful, and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Wow. Here's a few good points of what it means to be just simply a good father, a good man. He feared God. He was devoted to Him. He gave generously. He prayed to God regularly. Well, one day in verse 3, at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. In other words, God has seen, God has heard, God knows that you're there and it's come to him. Verse 5, now send me to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier. See, this man was a rich man. This man was a, a powerful man who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Amen. Father, right now I pray that you speak to us. Encourage us. Be that double-edged sword, God, that encourages us. But yes, at the same time, Lord, it cuts us. It, it transforms us. It challenges us, God. Lord, speak to every heart in this room, especially, Lord, to the men in this room. Speak to us in a way that you challenge us so that things are not the same, but we continue to be, become more and more like you, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you for never allowing us to stay in the garbage, in the sin, in the mud of the past. But you pick us up. You tell us today is a new day, and this is a word for us. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. This morning, there was something that I mentioned to the guys the first week of our men's Bible study back in September. As we sat in that gym, as we had our shorts and tennis shoes on, ready to play basketball, I told them there is something special when men go to church, when men worship, that they may think that they're just trying to figure things out on their own. That's what you might think as a man. You're just trying to figure this out. But your simple act of being here your presence of being in a church when that young man when that little boy when that little girl when they see a mom when they see a woman when they see that sister that lady eh, you know it's fine oh but when they see a man in the room there's something spiritual there there's something about wait wait a minute they're doing this too they're worshiping also they might not even see their own father here but they see you here and then all of a sudden, whether you are 15 years old as a young man, whether you're 20, whether you're 25 or, or 55 or 105, you being in this room, people, young men, young girls, they're watching you. And also the 
the ladies, the women, the older in the room will also find encouragement from your presence in the room. But again, it's not about these two hours on a Sunday morning. If, if you simply come here on a Sunday morning, and I've said this enough, it's not a religious game. It's not for us to simply come and just simply say things and act one way and put your hands up when you're supposed to and say amen when you're supposed to. If you are not that consistent man during the week, it's all hypocrisy. It's all fake. Now, I know that we're trying and we're working and doing all this. Well, then try harder. But you know what? No, that's not God. Trying harder is not God. Because that's the first thing we start thinking. Try harder. Come on. I, I need to do this. And as soon as Monday afternoon comes and you fail and you sinned and you did something that you know that you said on Sunday morning, I'm not ever going to do it again, God. And you do it again on, on Monday night. Well, I guess I'm worthless. Uh, I'll just see you next Sunday, God, I guess. That's why we're saying, God, I'm not trying to try harder. I'm trying to surrender harder. I'm trying to surrender. I'm trying to trust in you harder. I'm trying to start becoming the man that you've called me to be and the man that what a man truly is. Again, the, the world tells us a man is someone that has all the money, all the women, all the power, all of these things, all of these little toys, all of this stuff. And somehow that is what a man looks like. And the most muscular, six-packed men out there, with all the money in the bank, with all the women after them, and all the and all the the, the likes, because they're they're just little thirst traps on social media. They're just trying to show their bodies because somehow that makes them feel more like a man. They are the weakest little boys. They are the most fearful little boys. Because it comes not from what we have and what we think we are and what other people might say. You might impress other people. But it comes from us being able to actually just simply say, Father, I need you for you to be my leader, my God, my Father, the one that leads me so that I stop trying to do things my way. Lord, you do it your way through my life. When that happens... You become the strongest man. You become that David that was a little boy, little shepherd boy in front of a Goliath. That it wasn't about his body, his size, or his experience, or anything about that. But it was about the holy God that was in him. The presence of God that was all over him. When you live this way, oh, who cares about those people around you? There is no hell. There is no devil in hell. There is no demon that can come against you. When you are covered by the blood of Jesus and you are surrendered to him and you are living for him, there is nothing and no one that can come against you, the Bible says. You are more than a conqueror. You are victorious. You are strong. You are the man of God that he has called you to be. Oh, that doesn't compare to any of this. No wonder there is so many women, there are so many mothers that are having to take on your responsibility, man. Because... They don't see a man. They don't see someone that is willing to surrender their life to God, and so they have to do it. And it's sad because it does affect our children. It does affect our society. The problem out here in this world is not all the stuff. It's not, it's not the rainbows, and it's not the, the people arguing. It's not gangs, and it's not violence, and it's not drugs, and it's not all those things. Those are all a consequence of a lack of fathers of a lack of men, of a lack of young adult men who are willing to say, I am going to be an example for them. I have my dreams and I have my desires and I want this and I want that, but I need my mind, my thoughts, my desires to align themselves to what God wants in my life. When you do that, you begin to finally be molded in the way that God always wanted you to become. But it's been the sins of this world. It's been the, the, the ways that we have been discipled ever since little boys. We have been discipled by another friend who was discipled by an older cousin, who was discipled by their, by their, by their full of a dad, who was discipled by some grandfather, some, some grandpa. And, and, and we disciple ourselves. And you might say, I've never been discipled. But yeah, you have. You start following because you start thinking, well, that's what it means to be cool. That's what it means to be a, a, a man. Okay. 
Oh, 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 okay, let's all gather here. Let's let's all watch this video. Oh, that's what it means to be a man. I'm supposed to like that? Okay, I guess. And we've opened all of this garbage into our mind. Oh, smoke this, drink that. Come on, be a man. Oh, I've heard that so many times from uncles. Come on, aren't you a man? Drink this beer. It'll make you into a man. It'll put some, some, some uh, hair on your chest. Wow. That's what society says that being a man is. Hey, how many girlfriends you got? Six-year-old boy in first grade, how many girlfriends you have? And we think it's so cute, and we think, stop saying that stuff. Because that six-year-old boy will become a 16-year-old boy, will become a 26-year-old boy, and you're starting to, to complain, well, what's wrong with you? How come you got babies all over the place? Well, you told me that this is what it meant to be a man. This is that you told me that this was I'm supposed to be proud of of how many girlfriends I have and how many kids I'm, I'm I'm having everywhere. And I might be talking to some of you men in this room that yes, you are saved, you are sanctified, but you know that there have been consequences to some of the sin in your life. And so there are things that this world teaches us and disciples us on. And, and you watched this video earlier that says about how, how annoying it is that movies and sitcoms and videos and, and stuff, they just make men, it's just the, the funniest thing to be that dumb Homer Simpson, to be that dumb dad, that dumb sitcom dad, that, that everybody just makes fun of, that everyone just jokes around, oh, it's just dad, just clumsy, just dumb, just a drunk on the couch. That's just dad. And so where does that come from? Those writers that wrote those books and those stories and those movies, those writers are influenced by the men they saw in their own life. And so it's not them having a good imagination. They're simply basing it on the things that they themselves saw. And all of us in this room, including myself, we have all been there. We've all seen it. We've all had that, that we, many of us have, hopefully not all of you, but we've had that dad that comes in half drunk or, or fully drunk in the middle of the night and pushes us around or doing things that, that has no control. And in the Monday morning, he's going, hey, everything's fine. Everything's good. I'm going to work. I'm at work from Monday to Friday. I'm, I work hard for this so I can get my, my six-pack, which turns into a 12-pack, which turns into a 24-pack, which turns into all the other things and all the other bottles and everything else because I worked hard for this. Leave me alone. And that's why the world talks about dad being at the bar where the mom is taking care of the kids at home. And so there's all of these different ideas that we think what a man is supposed to do. And the Bible is telling us it's simple. And simple, my son, he says to you, if you simply surrender your life to me, I got this. You're trying to find peace and strength and all of this other stuff, and all of that stuff is killing you. Find peace in who I am. This isn't us being weak as men. That is weakness. So dumb to me to think that men think that going and, 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 and grabbing the, the strongest tequila is somehow strong. What? <laughs> and you're just laying on the floor later on. It's like one tequila, two tequila, three tequila floor, right? That's the, that's the joke. It's just you just, you're, you're laying on the floor. You're just, and you let your kids see that. And you're, you're peeing on yourself in your own bed. Come, that's a strong, that's strong. But saying, Father, I need you. God, I need you every day. Bless me. Bless my wife. Bless my children. Bless my home, my church. Use me, God. That is somehow weakness to the world. That is somehow, oh, you can't handle yourself, so you're going to have to go and find, find a, a God to help you. Yes. Yeah, it's true. I can't. And we need in the Bible, and the world calls it a clutch or, or a crutch, just trying to, oh, is this something you just need to live? Yes, we need God to help us survive, to help us live. But all of our ideas, all the way we've been discipled, all of our filters, all of our, of our desires, all of that needs to be cleansed. From the beginning of this year, Romans chapter 12, I don't have it on the screen, it's not in my notes, but Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, it tells us about surrendering our thoughts, our mind as an active, as a, as a living act of worship, that we allow God to transform our mind, not like the world has uh, uh, their, their, their way of thinking, but we're, we're trying to rethink things, how they were supposed to be all, all, all the way from Genesis in, in the Bible. It, we're supposed to think and act this way, but we've just messed it all up. But that's why, number one, 
godly fathers consistently seek God for vision. So I could have just simply left it at consistently seek God. That to many of us just thinks, oh, it's prayer. It's simply just going to him and saying, God, uh, bless my family, bless my wife, my children, uh, bless my future family, my future children, bless my career, bless this, bless that. Help me with this, help me with that. Thank you, God. Amen. But we're not just simply asking things from him. We're seeking him because the more we seek him, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, Seek me first. Seek me and my kingdom first. And all of your other desires, all your other needs and wants, and all of the other things that you think are important, start to align to his vision. Start to align to how we're supposed to look at this world and the things that we're supposed to have. And so that we no longer desire foolish things, but now things that give life and things that are eternal, that are not just going to affect our, our, our 80, 100 years here on this earth, but that they're eternal, that will affect generation after generation, way after you're gone because of the decisions you're making right now. So we're seeking him. This is our filter, or this is our eyeglasses that we're putting on that we need to look through. If you're still now a church goer, um, I thank God that you're here. I thank God that you're going to church now. I thank God that you're now making taking the step to read the Bible. But this Bible, your time in church, your time listening to messages, all of this is God is putting and creating a, on you a new filter. And if you block that filter, if you just put these on as if it was glasses and you put this on while you're reading the Bible and you're going, wow, that's good. Highlight this, draw this here. This is cute. Let me take a picture of it so I can show other people. This is great. Oh, I feel good about myself. All right. Thanks, God. I'll see you next morning or whenever. Because it's about allowing this to stay there. And it's not about a Sunday morning or your five-minute devotional, but this is about consistency. And when we consistently seek him, when we consistently do that, all, all of a sudden the way we think, the way we act, it starts changing. It starts, it's, we start having his vision, his reality, so that we're not as men going, now what? What am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed how where am I supposed to go? Are we as a family supposed to go here or there? Or are we supposed to be doing this or that? Or or how am I supposed to be a better husband or a better father? I don't I don't know. There's no manual anywhere. I, I try reading or watching some of these shows or or videos or trying to learn, but it, it it's difficult. I don't know. So what happens with a lot of men is that they simply give up. Ah, just give me a beer, give me my show, give me my sports. I'm good. I'm going to go to my man cave and just leave me alone. I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to think about this. I don't want to think about being the mature leader that I need to be for my family. No, no, no. I'm good. And so they simply give up and separate themselves from all those responsibilities. But what we're doing is saying, God, I'm seeking you so that you could give me your vision. So that now I am not a man that is trying to be married to my wife, but now I am treating my wife as I'm learning how you treat me. That now I am not, now not just simply fathering my children the way that I've learned or, well, my dad did it. My grandpa did it this way. Why wouldn't I do it this way? Because they were in sin. Because they weren't thinking right. Because that's not how things are supposed to be. Well, my dad was a drunk, so whatever. It's just, this is who I am. It's in my blood. It's just in my genes. The Bible says that he breaks those generational curses. And that he not only gives us, breaks the past, but now we should creating generational blessings. That now we get to now bless our children. Not because we are somehow trying to act better or be better, but now because we're seeking him and he's giving us a better vision. In verse 1, we are introduced to this man named Cornelius. And it tells us that God was working in him in a very powerful way, Acts chapter 10. And once again, God is always at work. 
When I was reading this, I was reminded of the time in which we were looking at this series of, of being called, as Moses was called. That whether we know it or not, God is always at work. That there are so many things behind the scenes. That in the same way that we sing the song, He is the way maker. Whether I feel it, whether I see it, whether I, any of that or not, He is working, He is doing things that you never thought. That you are here today because this took years for you to be here right now. That really, truly, since your mother's womb, God's been working, God's in control, God's been putting the right people around you, and you run from that, and you make your own dumb decisions, and then God still mercifully keeps putting things there in your family, in your life, co-workers and friends and, and, and people and family members, and, and he's answering prayers. He's putting all of this. God is always at work. So be encouraged with this. God doesn't care who it is. He is constantly working and drawing people onto himself. Peter had never met Cornelius. They lived about 30 miles away from each other. But here is God working in this man and in his family. God was pursuing. He was seeking his, this man. God is always working. There are people right now that you have never met, but you will meet them in a week from now or a year from now. You will become friends with them. You will become brothers and sisters in Christ with them. All because God is at work in them right now, and we are strangers with them. As you look around this room, some of you, you were a stranger to them just a few months ago. And now, they're some of the most important people in your life. They're the ones that are fighting the good fight along with you. They're the ones that are encouraging you and praying for you. You will become brothers and sisters with them. All because God is at work, but he will draw them in and he will save them because he is always working. Now, again, in verse one, we learn that Cornelius was a centurion. He was a captain of the Roman soldiers and Jewish people hated. And I mean, hated any time a row, every, any type of Roman plus a Roman soldier because of how they treated them. And so they just, they just grew up just knowing that you're supposed to hate the Romans. You're supposed to hate these Roman soldiers. Because I know that we live in a time in which we complain about police officers and all of this stuff and all. No, no, no. There is no such thing as pulling up at a red light and you just kind of looking over at the policeman and he just kind of ignores you and you just go on on your way. No, no, no. Back then, it was like, get out of your car. That's my car now. That back then was a chariot or your horse or whatever. But back then it was like, no, and I want you to now take my stuff and carry it for me. Go. And you were forced to do that. And so, yes, they had their reasons to complain about these Roman soldiers. But Cornelius is not your average Roman officer. Now, verse 2 tells us these four things about him again. He and his family were devout. They were God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. And he prayed to God regularly. So apparently this Roman, this Roman man, remember the Romans came with not this Christianity background. Now, yes, we, we, thought, we talk about the Roman Catholic Church. No, this is way before. And so this is a time in which they came with the Greek gods and they simply changed the Greek names to Roman names. And so Zeus became Jupiter. And, and, and so they, they simply took that. That was their religion. That was their thought. They also simply worshiped the emperor. The emperor was God to them. The emperor, they said that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what they would say about the emperor. So Paul took that and said, no, 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 no. Let me talk to you about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so they, they also believed that, that the emperor would die, come back to life, and go up into heaven. And Paul had to teach him and say, no, 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 let me tell you about the one that you go to his tomb and he's really not there. That it wasn't a spiritual, somehow a spiritual resurrection. No, no, no. This is a real resurrected king that he ascended into heaven. And so they had all these thoughts about their emperors. And so, so but apparently this Roman soldier had heard about the Jewish God, and he simply prayed to God. But the religion, through the religion of Judaism, and because the religion of Judaism would not allow him to fully become a Jew, but he was in search of the truth, and his Roman gods were not enough for him. So he had heard about this Yahweh God, this Jehovah God. He, he had heard about a Moses, and he had heard about the prophets of the Old Testament, and he had heard about a Messiah. 
So he had to learn some of these things. And you can imagine as, as just a Roman soldier, a captain seeking truth. You know, when you seek truth, it always ends up leading you to Jesus. When you really, really, when you're not, when you put all the other agendas aside and you're saying, I just, I just need truth. It leads you to, to the reality of who Jesus really is. Well, this man was almost there, but he wasn't there just yet. But God was working in him, and he was ready to bring a harvest there, not only to him, but to his whole family. And so he was hours away from total and complete transformation. So notice that up to this point, Cornelius was a man of religion about God. So he had learned from the Jews of how to worship a God that was somehow in heaven or somehow in a specific temple or a place, somehow that, that he was in required all these different laws, including circumcision. No wonder there's still a lot of men that think you need to do that and they don't want to go to church. And so there is, there is all of these different rules that they, would, they, that they needed to follow. And so Cornelius was learning about the religion about God, but he wasn't saved. There's a huge difference. He had religion, but he did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There are so many people today that still have a lot of religion. They have a lot of good intentions. They want to be a good person. They want to win themselves into heaven. As if somehow by the things that we do, we will impress God and that will lead us into heaven. But it's about the good news, also known as the gospel. The grace of God makes salvation free. And I love it when people say, I have never heard about this before. Or I never heard it put it this way. There's so much freedom to the pure and simple gospel of Jesus. Not about all the other things that we add on and follow and have to do this and all the rules and all of this stuff that leads people not want to have anything to do with Jesus. Let me tell you something. If the preacher you're listening to, if the, if the church you go to, and, and, and whoever you're listening to from your family or at work, if whatever their religion is or whatever their, their, their so-called Christianity is, if it's not leading you to Jesus, run. If it's leading you to somehow worshiping a man or is leading you to, to somehow worship money and worship possessions and things and your own satisfactions in life and your own uh, 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 selfishness, if it's leading you towards that, that's not Jesus. And so this man needed to be led towards Jesus. So again, though, Cornelius is seeking, but he has not yet met Jesus personally. But we know that Jesus has already been pursuing him. That's all part of the Holy Spirit, what he was doing. This is all about how God was working in him. And yes, even using those Jewish people that led him to start believing this. I've heard different testimonies of people saying, well, there was a moment in my life where I started to seek different religions. <laughs> That's God opening that desire. This isn't normal. What's normal to us is simply seeking for our own benefit, our own need. It's seeking how can I make more money? How can I have better relationships? How can I get be more successful in this and be known through this? And so that's normal to our sinful desires. But God begins to change our natural desires to then start seeking for some truth outside of ourselves. And at times, because of whatever's around us and who is influencing us, that might lead us to maybe some kind of Hinduism or some kind of Buddhism or, or putting on a, 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 maybe you put on a, a red string around your wrist and that's somehow supposed to give you good luck. Or, or maybe you go and, and, and you see all the TikTok trends. And so maybe if you get a, a, a cute little fat chubby man in green and you put, a, put it around your, your, uh, your, uh, as a necklace, that that's somehow supposed to uh, make you feel better about your life. Or, or, or maybe if you somehow start attending attending some place, uh, I don't know anybody that, that, that wants to do that, but you start attending some place and you start having to pray five times a day. You start, and you as a woman need to cover yourself from head to toe and, and you start following all these different, I've heard stories though of people saying, I, I started seeking Islam or I started seeking Hinduism and I started doing this and in that I met Jesus. That while I was seeking for truth, while I was seeking for the real God, 
that somehow this became so real and so truth. And because Jesus was pursuing this man. And so it says again in verse 3, one day at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. And he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. Imagine this Roman who had heard about Jupiter and Zeus and all of these gods and all of this stuff. He was probably thinking, what, what is happening to me? But um, yes, what do you need? What do you need, Lord? He asked the angel, answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. It was the honest and faithful prayers of Cornelius that attracted God to him, that attracted God to move in his life. Just don't just know that your prayers will not be wasted. You being here and you genuinely saying, God, I need you. I love you. I'm seeking you. Oh, that attracts God to you. That, that he wants to bless you. He wants to move in your life. They, they were, as the Bible calls them, this beautiful fragrance unto God. It's like this beautiful sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they would bring animals or vegetables, and they would sacrifice them at an altar, and the smoke would go up. And it was God's way of teaching them. See, there is this, this way of, of when you surrender something that's important to you, your food, when you surrender that, the smoke goes up into the heavens, and, and it's a way of, of us, of them at that time, recognizing that my this is worship. This is how it looks like. There is a physical smoke and smell going up to him. And so in the same way, God says, our prayers right now, in 2024, we don't have to bring a sacrifice, for Jesus was already the sacrifice on the cross. We simply bring to him our worship and our life. And when we do that, when we say on Monday morning, God, Thank you for yesterday, but here we go. Lord, I, I give you my life today. Help me today. Uh, use me today. Put the right people around me today so that I could be a blessing to them today. When you're doing that, it is a beautiful fragrance, an incense that is moving up. Who cares about how many candles or incense you go light in a religious building? If you are not living a beautiful fragrance throughout your day, if you're not truly living this out and so this man here, he has been praying, he and his family. And this wasn't that, it wasn't that somehow it won him points from God. No, no the angel is telling Cornelius, your heart has been noticed by God. God loves your heart, Cornelius. Imagine if an angel would show up to you and just tell you that. You don't need that. God, uh, God's telling you right now through this other messenger here this morning. And he's telling you, God loves your heart when you worship him in spirit and in truth. When you're not just simply seeking for your own benefit, but you're trying to surrender more. God sees you. God loves your heart. Notice that in verses 5 and 8 through 8, the, the, the call is given for Cornelius to take these steps now of faith. Again, you've been seeking God, but now here is time for you not to take these steps of faith. Again, God is telling Cornelius, you want answers? You want to be saved? You want more of God? Then go find Simon Peter. And Cornelius immediately obeys. He sends two of his servants to go find Peter. And Cornelius has no idea what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of him at this moment and what God was about to do with him, but we do. And Jesus is building his church right now, even through this Cornelius. This is the first time church. You have to understand, it was happening through the disciples, obviously, we would say. We know that Peter stood up and he preached. We know that, that, that John and, and Peter went and prayed with this man that was paralyzed and he could walk and run now. We know these different stories and one after the other. other. Last week we saw how they were being now arrested and, and, and threatened to be killed because of what was happening. But this is the first time that a non-Jew, a, a Roman, that you know the story, you know history, that later on all of Rome became a Christian. But at this moment God was just working all of this out right now. And so, here in Judea and Samaria, and we've seen how there's been this, this beautiful revival in all these regions. And Jesus said that they would go to the ends of the earth, and Cornelius is the beginning of God fulfilling his promises. Think of that right now, how God is so good and, and using this one family just to move and, and be, and be uh, uh, fulfilling his promises. The reason why we're here right now, worshiping in California right now, is because of this moment right here. 
This moment where God sends an angel to Cornelius. But I hope you notice that the angel doesn't preach the gospel to Cornelius. That's not the job of the angel. They're not even allowed to do that. They come with messages, specific messages. But whose job is it to preach the gospel to non-believers? It's our responsibility. Amen. But this was the angel saying, we got a messenger for you. And his name is Peter. Go find him. Cornelius is working all of this out. But again, it, it had to do first. If you want all of this to happen in your life, you seek him. It says in Jeremiah 29, verse 12, after the verse that you all love, but verse 12 says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, says God. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Keep seeking him. He will give you vision. He will give you ways to go and lead and how to do these things. Keep seeking him. You start surrendering your thoughts, your mind. You seek him. You keep, and, and we're not looking for a God that's hiding, by the way. He's not hiding from us. He wants to be seen. But it's us that need to, to look through all of the other filters of this life, all the other, all the other sunglasses that are too dark for us to look through that we need to start reading his word and seeking. And so all of a sudden, all those other things seem so foolish. That's why you that are having a hard time understanding this and you're just sitting here and you're just with arms crossed and you're going, just hurry up so that we could go and we could have a barbecue with that. Just come on. That's why sometimes it's hard for us to understand all this because you're not able to see, what, you're trying to see things with your own eyes with the same filters and garbage that the rest of the world has told you to look through. And so you come to the Bible and you're saying God is judgmental, God is mean, God is fake, God is, God is uh, uh, just this, this uh, patriarchal uh, white American thing that's just uh, God is racist, God is just uh, uh, offensive, all of this stuff. So, of course, you can't see him. Of course, there's no way for you to hear his voice. But when you say, God, I put all that aside, Lord. I want you, if you're real, tell him that. If you're really real, then talk to me. Then, then, then speak to me. And, and the pastor keeps saying that here in the Bible, you're going to talk to me. Well, then talk to me, God. And he's telling you right now, this is what it means to be a man. You seek God, he will give you a better vision. But number two, godly fathers consistently break down barriers. <laughs> when I was leaving the, the, the missing word there in your bulletin, it says, Godly fathers consistently break down. <laughs> That's, that might be true also in the presence of Jesus. But no, we are to break down the barriers, the garbage of racism, of sexism, of ageism, of, of whatever po politics and garbage that the world tells us. This is what it means to be a human. Again, this is what it means to be a man. I have to hate these people. I have, I have to hate these specific group of people. My dad taught me to never trust in those people. And so you have that curse over your life, and you start teaching your own children the same thing. We're not supposed to like those people. Those people are not for us. And you say both sides. Oh, I, you know, I, I remember my, my grandma would just teach me some stuff sometimes, and, and, and uh, she would say, you know, don't talk to them. Oh, no, no, they're scary. Don't talk to them. Or, or also, or here comes this, this gringo. Don't talk to that gringo. He's going he's, he's gonna to do something. With it. So, so no wonder when I was 19 years old working at a bank, I was scared of all the white old men. I was scared of them. I wouldn't talk to them. They would come to me, and I would just be like, yes, sir, uh-huh, yeah, whatever you need, yes, sir. All of a sudden, I became friends with them, and I was, I was like, oh, these, these white guys are cool. They're nice. And so, so we have those things, but the same, you know, we, we're, we're so racist ourselves. I have some kids that, that, that some, some students at the school, they won't even talk to some of the white, white teachers or people because they've grown up with these ideas of they're, they're, they don't like you. These preconceived ideas that if I walk into a room with, and they all look different than me, that I am the, the one excluded. And so they don't like me, and, and, and so I'm not supposed to like them. And so we walk into rooms with already this def defense behind us that, that we're just, we, we just want to argue with everybody. And so then you might laugh at that, but I say, oh, uh, if someone sits right here and they call themselves a, a Democrat, some of you will go and slap them or something. 
And 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 so you they they they, they have someone here. They tell you who they vote for. If you if you know who I voted for, it does none of your business. You'd probably be upset about me too. Maybe not, but that would make someone upset. But whatever it is, there's all of these barriers we divide ourselves with. And you know who loves this? The devil. The devil loves to bring all this little division, especially to a church, especially to a family, especially between sons and their fathers. That's why we have so many boys and, and daughters and girls and boys that they have no relationship with their dad because they somehow went to school, read a book, watched a six-second video on YouTube or whatever, and they, and, and they went to college, and all of a sudden they woke up, and they come back for Thanksgiving break and say, you don't know anything, Dad. <laughs> you're just a racist. You're just a, uh, uh, with your mind closed, closed-minded, and, and you're just judgmental, and I know it all. And then the dads, out of, out, of, out of reaction, they're saying, yeah, I know it all, and you're wrong, and then get out of my house. And then 50 years later, they're there, driving over here down, down Harding Way. The cemetery is full. The cemetery is full of people visiting their dad at the cemetery because they couldn't talk to him while they were alive. And so when we allow these barriers to divide families, our relationships with our own dads and with their children. We're allowing the enemy to do exactly what he wants to do. But let's look at verse 9 now in chapter 10. About noon the following day, as they were, the servants of Cornelius, on their journey and approaching the city where Peter was, Peter went up on the roof to pray. God is working things right here. Notice. It wasn't him alone that wanted to go and pray. It was the Holy Spirit. God didn't, uh, or it wasn't you that just decided to come to church on Father's Day on Sunday morning. Holy Spirit is working in your life for you to be here today. And so he went up to go pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. So don't get all spooky and mystical and stuff. It's just that it's, it's just hard to explain spiritual things sometimes. Put words on it. It's, it's that feeling you have when you're praying and, 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 and uh, uh, Pentecostals, we call, it, we call it getting drunk on Jesus. It's that feeling where you're just like sitting there and you don't know what's happening, but you just love Jesus. And there might be tears involved or, or laughter involved and you're just, and the music's playing and, and maybe you're just by yourself and they're just quiet, but you're just in the presence of God and it's something very, very supernatural. And, and so you're, you're starting to feel all of this. Well, he's in this trance. It's just the best word to describe it. It's not that he was going, um, and then somehow it started to elevate or something. No, he's just praying. But while he was praying, he saw heaven open up and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. I love uh, uh, Luke is describing this. Peter told him the story. Luke is writing these things down, and, and Luke is describing this, and he's saying, I don't know, something like a white sheet <laughs> being led down to earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. What are we doing right now? What are we reading? Okay, well, just wait. Then a voice told them, get up, Peter. Go kill him and eat. And Peter goes, excuse me? No, that can't be you, God. Surely not, Lord. Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean, said the fisherman. Okay, so, so listen, listen. There are moments where, where humans, humans are still human. Humans were still conceived by sin, and still there is still a lot of us in ourselves. So just because all of a sudden you're the apostle, Peter, and some of us even call him Saint Peter. Just because you have some kind of title or you're on a stage or you're preaching the Bible or something, sometimes we still get a little bit, you know, full of ourselves that we need to empty ourselves every time. And so here Peter, he's forgetting everything that God's been doing in his life, and so he's still, he still has a lot of Jew in him, and he's some, he needs some more Jesus in him. And he says, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Verse 15, the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. 
This happened three times. There he goes again. Peter with his three times. Peter denies Jesus three times. Here he is again saying, no, God, I'm not going to do this. And God says, stop. Stop calling things that are impure. I've made them pure. He didn't say that he was wrong. He didn't say that, that what he, you know, Peter, again, is, is trying to honor the Old Testament. He's trying to honor the rules of God. Because it wasn't that somehow Jesus came up with this new religion. It was the same God of the Old Testament, but now Jesus fulfilled all those laws. And so when did it become pure? When, did we, or when were we able to now start eating bacon, in other words? At the cross. Because the sacrifice was finished. The sacrifice was done. Now that we are no longer having to follow rules about eating pork and ham and, 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 and bacon and, 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 okay, I need to stop, and, and, and shrimp and all of this. And so all of these rules were done so that God could tell them, okay, worship me, honor me. And so let me, let me keep going. Verse 16, this happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, <laughs> here's your meaning, Peter. The men sent by Cornelius, the Roman, non-Jewish, impure person that I'm supposed to hate, found out where Simon's house was, and he stopped at the gate. Poor Peter so confused right here. And who can blame him? Peter is praying. Peter is hungry. And God gives him a vision about food. And God knows how to get our attention. But what does food have to do with the Roman getting saved? Well, one of the biggest differences between Jews and Gentiles was their food. Remember that there was a time when the people of Israel were simply former slaves out of Egypt, born and raised as slaves, never knew anything else, and God frees them from their Egyptian captivity, and then they end up in the desert. Well, God teaches, he teaches them how to eat. He's telling them, okay, now that you don't have just, you know, the Pharaoh telling you what you're supposed to eat, let me show you how to eat and how to survive out here in the deserts. There's no refrigerators. There's, there's none of that. Let me show you how to do this. He gives them rules and laws of what animals are clean and to eat and which ones are not. And there was a practical purpose behind all of this. But God was also trying to teach them how to honor him even through their eating. It's like when we pray. God bless this Big Mac. May it, be, may it be nutritious to my body. Bless this cake right now in Jesus' name. No, 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 no. That, that moment of prayer should also kind of help us reflect on what we're eating as well. And so, but I'm not talking about, about McDonald's. And so, imagine your whole life when you've been taught that you can't eat bacon because it's disobeying God. And just like that, through, his, through this dream, God tells him, I have everything new. This food is unclean. Go ahead and eat your, your bacon, your ham. And for those that like it, some pig hooves too. Go ahead and eat that too. Uh, that's the stuff that, that, that I think uh, Gabe loves to eat. Pig hooves and some weird stuff, snouts and all that. You know, he said, yeah, just grill it and everything tastes the same. So Peter is probably like, at this moment, are you sure, God? Peter was confused and worshipped, and he was worried, though, because God was not just changing Peter's diet. He was changing the entire program. His entire way of understanding God, one of the great realities of the gospel is not that, it's not that Jews are clean and Gentiles are not clean. The reality is that we are all unclean. That we're all sinners. We all need to be washed and saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 16 says that God gives this message to Peter three times, like I said. Remember how Peter had denied Jesus three times. And Jesus meets Peter after the resurrection. And he was so discouraged, but Jesus tells him to feed his sheep three times. Then he tells them, you're going to go feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Yes. Do you love me, Peter? Yes. Do you love me, Peter, truly? Yes, I do. And go feed my sheep. This is your opportunity, Peter. Go feed the sheep. Oh, but I don't like those sheep. Oh, but those sheep are a different color. Oh, but those sheep are from a different people. I'm not comfortable with those sheep. You know, God, that I'm introverted and I don't like talking to those type of sheep. And once again, three times God sends him this message that he could really understand this. 
And as dads, we sometimes need to break down our own barriers, whether they're prejudices, fears, past experiences, to lead our families with love, with wisdom. There are things that we've done. Now, I'm not saying that we are supposed to be changing with everything that is changing around us. We will be tempted because our, our, our kids and other young people and whatever, there's going to be people that are going to start telling you, you got to be this and that. I'm not talking about changing those things and changing who God is and, and being okay with this and that because, well, everybody else is doing it and I don't want to get canceled. But I'm talking about holding on to his truth. But all the other garbage that is not Jesus, that is not biblical, that is just the world told you that this is how you're supposed to be, all of that needs to surrender. And as a man, we have a great responsibility because as men go, the family goes as well. And so in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. In Galatians chapter 3, it says, There is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is, there is no male or female. For you are, you are all one in Christ. Now, before you start talking about genders or stuff, this is just simply talking about that, yes, you are male. Yes, you are female. But it doesn't mean that males are more important than females are not, or that females are more important than males are not. It just simply means that under God, yes, you being Jew is important. You being a Gentile or a Mexican or a British or, a, or, or, or whatever, or, or Portuguese, whatever it may be, all of that is important. But you are not above anyone else. We all need Jesus. And God will use us in those ways, in specific ways. This leads us to verse 17. And so let me just give you a summary of this. And Peter meets the servants of Cornelius. They tell him about the vision that Cornelius had, and Peter's amazed. So he travels back with them. And in verse 23, it says, The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. You see, now there's a crowd. And so they're all coming down the road, and they, and they, and they show up to Caesarea. And Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. There's moments like this when I read this that I didn't catch that. That because Peter was willing to go, those other followers went along too. That his testimony of going, okay, God, I don't know what you're doing. I could be baking now, and apparently you're okay with Romans now. <sighs> All right, I'm going to trust in you, God. And when he does this, the other believers said, hey, let's go. The other believers said, okay, okay, if Peter said, or let's, let's do this. All right, then we're going to believe this now. That when you start... Letting go of some things that, again, for you and your family, whether it's race, whether it's sexism, whatever it is, things that we grow up with, division that we grow up, don't go to that side of Stockton. Oh, if I could just tell you how many times we would have paid off all this building if I would have gotten paid. Every time someone says, where's your church at? Oh, it's over on the east side. What part? On Cherokee Road. Oh, that's over by Wilson Way. Yes, praise the Lord. Oh, okay. Well, God bless you. Uh, we don't go over there. You know, or when we've had different events over at the Stockton Fairgrounds, revival services and tent meetings and stuff, and they say, it's going to be over at the fairgrounds. On the south side? Oh, no, we'll pray for you guys to have a good time. All of that division, all of that stuff, when you start doing this, other people will follow you. Your children will start recognizing that this is not how we're supposed to be. And so it says that they started going in verse 25, as Peter entered the house, they, he meets him, Cornelius met him, and fell at his feet in reverence. This is the apostle Peter. I think all of us, I don't know now, but I mean, at that time, Peter, would, everybody would have been like, wow, this is Peter. I humble myself unto you, Peter. But Peter made him get up. He says, stand up. He says, I'm no pope for you to be, you know, somehow bending your knees in front of me and worshiping me. I'm only a man myself. I'm only a man myself. I'm not Saint Peter. I'm not the Pope. I'm not anybody like that. I am just a man. So number three, godly fathers lead with humility. Stand up. I'm only a man. Peter didn't let his position go to his head. He remained humble. Great fathers lead with humility. A humble dad recognizes that, they're, that he's not perfect, but he is always striving to improve, to serve, and help, and bless his family. 
So as men, it's not the, the, the temptation is always that the enemy gives us. When you start reading your words, sometimes I'm, honestly, I'm scared <laughs> to allow some new man that comes with all his sin, and they starts reading, before they start reading the Gospels and who Jesus is, they start reading Paul. And they start reading about, women, submit yourself right now. And I like that part. I'll stop there because the next verse said, and men, submit to your wives. Oh, my. No, no, no. I don't read that part. That's what they say. And so they start focusing on all that. And there's such pride and such arrogance. And they clean it up and they call it Christianity. That's not what this is about. As fathers, we should be the first ones humbling ourselves and being a servant, being a, 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 a helper, being there for our wives and our children so that they could see it as an example. And if they see as if dad does this here, then I will do the same. If my husband is doing this for me, I will be glad to do that for him. And in Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves. Let your children see that. Let, let again, those young people, those that you, you don't have your kids yet, but start being this type of man. That you put others before you, that you serve others, that you're helping this way, that you see all of this as a, as a great opportunity from Monday to Saturday for you to live this out. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, we just read this in our men's Bible study last week, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves. Don't ask God, humble me, God. I'm too prideful. Oh, he will. He will. So before he has to humble you, you humble yourself. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. He will. He does. He lifts you up, and all of a sudden, you start getting nice uh, uh, Father's Day gifts on Sunday morning with a smile. Instead of instead of with, with, with here. Ah, there you go. Or, Dad, I forgot. Or, Never hear from them. Or you get a collect call from a son, maybe. And, and so you start, you start thinking, oh, then, then it's in these moments of humility. And so practice humility by listening to your family's needs and admitting when you're wrong. Encourage an environment where everyone feels valued. They feel heard. Open up and be that kind of guy. Be that kind of person. Be that kind of, of woman as well. Be the person that is, that is willing to say, you know, I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. Let's, let's stop it right here before another week, and everybody's all passive-aggressive, walking around all, all, all angry, and they don't talk to each other. There's just, I was wrong, period. It's done. Okay, let's move on from this. How can I learn from this? What are the things that I need to do so I don't do this again? And that's how it works. I'm giving you some good uh, premarital counseling right now. And in Acts chapter 10, go back to verse 30 now. Let's finish this. Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour. He's telling Paul, uh, Peter, at three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes, this angel stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Notice how much God sees that as well. It's not just prayer, but it is actions, faith in actions. It was blessing others. It's, it's he was giving, and God says, yes, that's the kind of person that I'm willing to bless now because he's not just keeping that to himself because he's willing to give to someone else. I'm going to bless him as well. And so verse 32, sent to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a great, he is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner. What is a tanner, by the way? It's someone that is working with leather. And so what? He's there in this house. Imagine the smell of this house. Imagine how, how, how the smells and the animals and the blood and all of that. I don't know how Peter was hungry, first of all. But also, no wonder God used even the place where he was sitting, where he was living, to speak to him and he's saying, all of this is just animals now. It's just, it's just food for you now. It's just, it's just leather now. It's not for you to worry about all of the other things that, that you're worried about. So it's right, right there while he was at the Tanner's house that, that he was sent. So verse 33, so I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Thank you. Now we are here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell. And it's amazing that Cornelius is not saved yet, but he has recognized God. 
And within this moment, I hope you can recognize the sovereignty of God. Again, that means that God is in control. God is moving. He is moving in a man in Joppa. He's dealing with his issues. He's moving in a man in Caesarea. God brings them together. These two meeting like this will change the world. It will affect the Stockton, California someday. I can imagine Cornelius walking through Jerusalem after the crucifixion and the disciples, including Peter, hiding from him. Now, here God takes him to his house. <laughs> These are supernatural appointments. We need to always be ready because he's moving even when I don't see it or even when I don't feel it. God is still moving. God is always doing this, putting people together. He's, he's doing this. You know, I, I joked around about, about, you know, gringos in the past, and you know, right now, and, and how that was something that was put in my mind. <laughs> and I ended up marrying one, right? That's so funny. But some of the stuff my grandma, you know, I don't know what, what made her think this way. Some of the stuff that, she, that my mom learned from my grandma and from my great-grandma, my great-grandma, man, she was Christian, but she was from the south side of the kingdom, as they say. She was, she, she, she was saved, but I don't know how sanctified she was. Oh, oh Nana Kuka. <laughs> and, and I grew up also knowing or believing that don't talk to black people. Don't, don't, they're going to be, they, they, they're going to, they're going to steal from you. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. They're, they're, they're violent. They're scary. And, and, uh, all of that stuff. And again, thank God, all of that stuff cleansed me out. And I remember going to specific meetings, and they were they were they were called uh, 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 Mecha, and it was called it was uh, the Chicano movement. It was all about uh, uh, being proud of, of being a Mexican American and, and all of that. And and I loved it. But in the meetings, they would talk to us about how this is for us Mexicans, and us Mexicans need to do this, and the, us Mexicans need to live this way, and 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 not, don't talk to the white devil, and don't talk to the black man, and don't talk to any of this. It's us Mexicans. I'm telling you all of this, and, and thank God, at like 16 years old, I'm going, you're all fools. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is not good. This is not okay. And God had to clean, cleanse me of all of that too. And, and so, so being able to be transformed from that. But I say all this because just as an example, uh, Grim and I were laughing on, on, on uh, what was it, Wednesday morning, we were laughing and we were saying, who would have thought? He was telling me that, that, you know, one of his best friends would be a pastor at work. That he would never have thought that a year ago. And, and, and then I didn't tell him this because, you know, I, I didn't want me to look weird. And right now I got all of you to just defend me. But at the same thing, I was thinking too, I was like, man, me too, uh, to have a young man, 25, 20, 25, right? 26? 25 years old. My, one of my best friends there too, just a, a guy that we, we get to be with together. And all of that garbage and all of that stuff and all about, well, he's older, he's this, he's that, he's younger, he's this, he's that. All of this stuff, just, just all of that division separates and we become brothers. It's like when I've shared with you that I've, I, I used to go to the, to the uh, prisons and I used to go and, and do uh, Bible studies there. And I would have a Bible study with this, this one uh, a guy and, and, and he told me, he's like, I used to be a, a skinhead Nazi. He said, I used to just hate black people, hate Mexicans, hate anybody. And, and it was there in the prison. He said, I got saved here. And he said, so I'm asking for books and I'm asking for different ways to learn how to lead Bible studies. He says, because I've been reading the Bible and leading a Bible study, he says, with a, with a, a, a former crip, a black guy on this side, and then on this side, a, a, a Norteño, a, a Mexican on this side. And so he's like, I'm sitting here, and he's like, we're having Bible study among ourselves, he says, and we've never felt freer than never before. He says, because of what God's been doing in our life. This is what God does. And so, again, you need to be ready in the same way that God placed us and for us to be working at a school down, uh, down in the south side of Stockton or, or, or for us to come here to this church or, or for you to be here and, and how God has put all of us from different backgrounds, different races, what the world tries to do to bring uh, uh, people together and politicians try to do this and they can't figure it out. It's through Jesus. And as men, here we are, we're saying we need to be ready. Because he's moving even when I don't see it or even when I don't feel it. God is still moving. 
And that's why the last one, number four, godly fathers are consistently open to change. This humility, this breaking down barriers, this seeking of God leads you to a change, a change of heart, a change of pride, a change of love, a change of understanding that I am willing to let go of some of this that I've been taught by my own father or, or, or grandparents or whatever, and you're, you're, you're now living under, under the authority of Jesus. And Peter visits, visits Cornelius, and this is so significant, this change. In verse 34 it says, Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, says Peter, but asks, but accepts from every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right. Who is a son of God? Who is a daughter of God? Who does God love? The one who fears him, who honors him, respects him, lives with him, recognizes his authority and obeys him, and lives not scared of God, but lives under the authority of God and does what is right. You want to be blessed? You want to be a good man? You want to be a good father, a good husband? The one who fears God and does what is right. You know, it, it, we, we laugh sometimes in our men's Bible studies because we look around and it's like, how is it that a brother Alex is just talking to, to Josh? How is it that a brother John is talking to a Grim or to a Luis? And how is it that, you know, we're having this, these, these good conversations among each other. and We love each other. We're, we're brothers. We, we would fight for each other. We would do everything possible for one another. We would pray for each other. And this is what God does when he changes our hearts. I love that on Father's Day, it is a challenge to all of us for us to humble ourselves. And again, it actually is here in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and we finish with this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. But pastor, you don't know what happened in my past. I don't. God does. And he was there with you. He didn't allow those things to happen. Those things happen because of sin and the sin that affects everyone and, and, and how relationships are broken and people are affected and, and how your relationship even with your own dad. There's a lot of people that can't even stand coming to church on Father's Day because they're going to talk about fathers, and they just can't handle that. There is so much bitterness, hate, anger against their fathers. There's some people that can't even pray and say, Father, who are in heaven. They can't even pray that way because it reminds them of their own dad. So when you tell them that God is their father, they say, no, thank you. But this is our, these are moments right here when we're saying, God, I want you to transform me. I want you to stop, help me to just stop thinking this way. I want you to, yes, to, right now we're going to pray for a relationship with our dads. Maybe, that, maybe it's not good. In 2024, this isn't a nice, cute little Father's Day message. Everybody loves each other. No, we recognize that there are difficult things between, between generations. The devil's church has tried strong to bring an attack on generations and division. And maybe you have a bad relationship with your own dad. Maybe you have a great father, a great dad. Maybe your own dad right now is no longer here on this earth, but is alive in heaven. Maybe that's happened as well. But we all have a, still a responsibility here to be the mothers and fathers that God has called us to be to everyone, to the kids around us, to the, to the people that we love, to the, to, the, to the people that we work with, to the kids in our neighborhood, in our own family. All of that, God has given us this opportunity for us to minister and to be his hands and feet and his voice to them. And so do not allow the bitterness of because something that happened to you in the past or somehow your relationship with your father is not working. You go and you seek him and you call him and you, and you do your best to say, hey, dad, happy Father's Day. What a great opportunity today. It won't be weird for you to talk to your own dad. But it is Father's Day, I guess. So, hey, happy Father's Day. And at that moment, you start praying even on your way there. God, restore my relationship with my dad. Restore my relationship with my father with my uncles, with the people in my family.